woman tests positive for arsenic poisoning just in time to save her life. But others before her weren't so fortunate. Now investigators must build a case on cremated remains. Doctors watch helplessly as a man wastes away and dies. Detectives diagnose it as murder. And unless they can stop it, it may be going around. A young woman is killed in a tragic riding accident. But a series of subtle clues leads investigators to believe that this tragedy was really no accident. Most victims are poisoned by someone they trust done in by a fatal lapse of judgment, but it only takes investigators a whisper of suspicion to detect a taste of poison. In March of 1988, in the rural town of San Angelo, Texas, paramedics responded to a call at the home of Lita and Algie Nobles. Lita told the paramedics that she and Algie had both been suffering from a stomach flu. Algie had refused to go to the hospital. Three days after the onset of his symptoms, Lita found Algie unconscious. Paramedics pronounced him dead. Lita Nobles had been nursing her sick husband for months. He'd been in a car accident that should have claimed his life. With a shattered jaw, he could only eat baby food. About time. What kind of garbage is this? Algie's convalescence was far from yeah. peaceful. Yeah. Just wait, yeah. complaining. You're always complaining about it. He and Lita do. fought like what cats and dogs. All the time. Well, you just don't know what it's like, Kevin. Despite the tension, he seemed right, to be right, making a swift right recovery. Lita wasn't faring as well. The stress of tending to her quarrelsome husband aggravated her ulcers. She lived on antacids. Two months after Algie's death, a close friend, Tim Scoggin, brought Lita to the hospital. She complained of extreme fatigue, vomiting, and stomach pains. She had lost a large amount of blood. Doctors believed an ulcer was to blame, but treatment didn't improve her condition. Weeks passed. Her condition worsened. Then her hands and feet became paralyzed. Looking for a cause, doctors ran a battery of tests including a screen for heavy metal poisoning. I think what we're going to have to wait for is that blood test to come back. And a urinalysis came back positive. Lita Nobles had arsenic in her body. The Texas Rangers were contacted. Investigator George Frazier's first job was to eliminate environmental contamination as the source of the toxin. When we first started the investigation, all that we knew was that there was presence of arsenic in the body of Lita Nobles. So in the process of elimination, to find out where she got this poison, we tested her water well. Her house was on a water well. Arsenic is a poisonous metal found naturally in the earth. Because it is an element, it can't break down. But its atoms can combine to form other compounds. A little arsenic has a lot of killing power. In rural Texas, it was once used as a cotton defoliant. Through runoff, it could contaminate a water supply. Samples from the noble's home were taken and tested. The well was clean. Investigators questioned Lita's brother and sister-in-law who stayed at the house after Algie's death. Neither of them suffered any symptoms, even though they had eaten all of their meals there. 
And yet, during that time, Lita grew progressively sicker, suggesting she'd been repeatedly exposed to the arsenic. As investigators eliminated every possible source of accidental contamination, they came to one grim conclusion. Lita Nobles hadn't been randomly poisoned. She had been targeted for murder. Someone wanted her to die. Are you using Investigators kind of questioned her about who might want her dead. Well, nothing to speak of except what's out in the garage, insecticides and things like that. She pointed the finger at her deceased husband. Our first suspect in Lita's poisoning was Algie uh, because she felt like they, they were an older couple and they had a lot of times that they just quarreled and, and uh, bit at each other, seemed like, all the time. And uh, she first told us that if she had been poisoned, he did it. And so we had to eliminate him as a suspect even though he was already dead. To find out whether Algie had had a hand in his wife's illness, detectives needed to know whether she'd been poisoned before or after his death. The victim's hair, they believed, would answer that question. Arsenic stays in hair and fingernails long after it has left the bloodstream. By analyzing those traces, forensic scientists would be able to determine how and when Lita had been poisoned. And if they knew that, they'd have a better idea of who tried to kill her. At Texas A&M University, research chemist Dennis James uses a nuclear reactor to determine the precise amount of trace elements in a given sample. The process is called neutron activation analysis. Neutron activation analysis is capable of testing for a lot of different types of materials. Some of those are poisonous and some of those aren't. Uh, it is particularly sensitive to transition metals and some of the heavy metals in particular. Lita's hair was cut into six segments, each representing about a month of hair growth. By comparing the amount of arsenic in each segment, scientists could build a timeline showing when each dose was consumed and how much arsenic it contained. The canister containing the samples is shuttled to the core. There, it is exposed to nuclear energy for six hours, during which time some of the elements in the samples absorb subatomic particles and become unstable. Once removed from the reactor, the elements decay, losing the extra subatomic particles. As they do so, they emit a distinct burst of energy called a gamma ray. Using a gamma ray detector, technicians look for arsenic's signature emission. By comparing the readings from the hair snippets to that of the control samples, they can calculate the concentration of arsenic in each sample. Each snip of Lita Noble's hair, progressing from tips to scalp, showed an increasing amount of arsenic. Lita's dosage had gradually increased over at least six months. By administering moderate amounts of arsenic over that length of time, the killer had inadvertently given Lita a tolerance for the poison, which he tried to overcome with a whopping dosage shortly before Lita was hospitalized. The poison had been administered after Algy was buried. He couldn't have been the culprit, but he may have been a victim. Though Algy's hair was too short to tell scientists how long he'd been poisoned, tissue samples taken from his body showed that he, like his wife, endured a massive dose of arsenic. The toxin was found throughout his organs. Finding the poisoner wouldn't be as easy as finding the poison. Someone with access to the elderly couple had, over time, been administering toxic doses of arsenic into their food or drink. That meant that the murderer was probably someone close to the nobles. Someone they trusted. Investigators faced the delicate task of asking the victim's friends to point out who among them might be a poisoner. 
a neighbor had a suggestion. And this next door neighbor felt that a young man named Timothy Scoggin was a very likely suspect because he spent a lot of time in their home. New in town, Scoggin was a well-liked member of the San Angelo community. Best known for his skill as a porcelain painter and his willingness to help the town's senior citizens with errands and odd jobs. He was a mortician by trade, but appeared to be doing well in a series of business ventures. And he loved to make himself useful. Among the elderly people he helped were Lita and Algie Nobles. Shortly after befriending them, he had purchased their air conditioning business. Although he was chronically behind in his mortgage payments, Lita's faith in this surrogate son never wavered. After Algie's death, Lita had relied heavily on him. To Fraser, Scoggin fit the profile of a poisoner. First of all, he had motive. He owed the victims $100,000. Secondly, he had access to the noble's home. Finally, he had his victims' undying trust. After we suspected Timothy Scoggin, we went and talked to Mrs. Noble and interviewed her in the hospital room. She practically ran us out. She liked this guy. He was coming to the hospital room and, and doing her hair and doing her nails. But it wouldn't be long before Frazier could expose the greed beneath Scoggin's angelic demeanor. He learned that during the time of Lita's hospitalization, there had been a lot of suspicious activity in her bank account. While she lay in bed, nearly $48,000 in personal checks had been written to Tim Scoggin. Suspicious for a woman who had no use of her hands. She has these rubber bands and braces on her hands and couldn't sign her name if she wanted to. So we passed those checks in front of her and asked her how she signed those. And that was enough to convince her that he was the one. But check forging doesn't prove homicide. If detectives were going to turn their suspicion into a murder charge, they'd need to know more about what made Tim Scoggin tick. A probe into his past convinced investigators that his penchant for poisoning didn't start with Lita and Algie Nobles. And it's very nice, sure. Investigators learned that before moving to San Angelo, Tim Scoggin had lived with two elderly sisters who had died suddenly within days of each other. Scoggin boasted he'd probably be inheriting a small fortune from these deceased aunts. Well, thank you very much. But the true story was far different than the version Scoggin had been spreading around town. They were not aunts. They weren't any kin to Timothy Scoggin. However, interestingly enough, he had been kind of a houseboy, an errand boy for them and had lived with them off and on for a long time. As he had done with the nobles, Scoggin endeared himself to Catherine and Cordelia Norton. I thought this might pick up your spirits a little bit. Just five weeks before Algie Noble succumbed, both sisters were dead. In February, Scoggin had taken Catherine Norton, a diabetic, to the hospital for a checkup after her surgery for cancer of the pancreas. Cordelia! When they returned home, Cordelia became violently ill. He quickly shuttled the older sister to the hospital. Scoggin and Catherine returned home and went to sleep. Thanks so much, and you have a good night. Scoggin stayed at the house in case Catherine needed anything. In the morning, Scoggin checked on Catherine, and, finding her unresponsive, called her doctor. He pronounced Catherine dead. The next day, Cordelia died in her hospital bed. Both deaths were ruled natural causes. No, I think probably he's already Six months after the deaths of the Norton sisters, investigators wanted to know if they, like the nobles, had been poisoned by arsenic. 
problem was Catherine and Cordelia Norton had been cremated. Investigators learned that Tim Scoggin had used his expertise as a mortician to destroy any evidence of foul play in the deaths of the Norton sisters. He used that knowledge to, to know how to forge orders for cremation, which he presented on both of these ladies and said that they had personally requested from him that they be cremated as soon as they had died, and they were promptly cremated and buried. Investigators now were faced with the task of detecting poison in ashes. No one had ever tried this before. If scientists could navigate this uncharted territory, they'd be one step closer to catching a murderer. The ashes of Cordelia and Catherine Norton were brought to the Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Laboratory, where toxicologist Rod McCutcheon was asked to analyze them chemically. He was initially doubtful about his chance of success. I really didn't think there would be much of a chance to find any poison in cremation remains. I'd never heard of anyone trying to do this. After reflecting a minute about the particular poison he was interested in, the arsenic, uh, I realized that there was some possibility that the arsenic may still be present because it's an element, and an element will not change. To test for the presence of arsenic, McCutcheon placed the cremated remains in an acidic solution, then heated it. Impurities are burned away. If there is any arsenic, it remains in the liquid. Chemicals are added to turn the arsenic into a gas. It bubbles through a liquid, which turns purple in the presence of arsenic. The more arsenic in the sample, the more intense the color. The tests showed that Cordelia's remains contained lethal amounts of arsenic. Catherine's remains showed none. The negative findings in Catherine's ashes actually bolstered the case by serving as a control. Since both sisters had died on the same day and had been cremated in the same oven, the lack of arsenic in one of the samples proved that the ashes were not contaminated by the burning process. Neutron activation analysis confirmed the findings. Detectives began their pursuit of Scoggin by seeing if he had purchased arsenic. They visited the local grocery store. There's nobody in there, Can I help you? Uh, yeah. Are you the owner? Yes. Great. Here, yeah. Tim Scoggin's love of familiarity would strike against him. The clerk told detectives that he remembered Scoggin buying a large amount of rat poison shortly before any of the victims died. The primary ingredient of rat poison is arsenic. Investigators deduced that Scoggin had mixed the poison with products that he knew only his victims would eat, Algae's baby food and Lita's antacid. Since he regularly delivered their groceries, he could have mixed up the rat poison before bringing them over. To test their hunch, investigators searched the noble's cabinets and refrigerator. Most of the food had been thrown away, but a few of Lita's antacids were still around. A single bottle of the medicine tested positive for arsenic. Based on the scientific evidence, law enforcement was ready to take Tim Scoggin into custody. The real strong thing that made the case for us was the work done in the laboratories. Of course, there's no other way we would have ever found uh, arsenic in those ashes nor in the body of Mr. Nobles. And so the people who did the forensic work really are the ones who turned the crank in this case for us. We'd probably still be working on it if it hadn't been for them finding this heavy metal poison. Scoggin was arrested for the murder of Algy Nobles and the attempted murder of Lita. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. And even though there was no direct proof that he killed Catherine Norton, investigators believe he tampered with her insulin dosage. He subsequently pleaded guilty to the murders of both sisters and was given two 50-year sentences.
The horrifying truth is that poisoners often get away with their crimes, at least for a while. But vigilance and persistence are strong antidotes to a poisoner's toxic schemes. On November 1st, 1982, paramedics in St. Peter's, Missouri were summoned to the home of Lloyd and Shirley Allen. 40-year-old Lloyd Allen had been sick for months with an undiagnosed illness. That morning, his wife said, he became violently ill, then lost consciousness. The coroner believed that he died from natural causes, but he couldn't be sure. On the death certificate, cause of death remained blank. A few days later, Detective Robert Birding of the St. Charles County Sheriff's Department learned of a series of anonymous calls phoned into the local news station. Lloyd Allen hadn't died a natural death, the tipsters said. He'd been poisoned. A canvas of uh, Lloyd Allen's neighbors uh, was initiated, and it was subsequently learned that the anonymous phone calls uh, came from one or more of Lloyd's uh, neighbors. Detective Birding did a routine follow-up to see if the phone calls had any merit. Meantime, authorities prevented the body from being buried, pending investigation. Hi, ma'am. I'm Sergeant Birding from St. Charles County Sheriff. The neighbors told police that the timing of his illness was suspicious. Lloyd's health and behavior changed drastically after his new wife and her daughters moved in. To investigators, these neighborly observations didn't seem like much at first, hardly the kind of information to hang a murder investigation on. But they prompted police to ask more questions about the Allen family. Friends and neighbors told police that problems began shortly after Shirley and Lloyd married in the fall of 1981. Everyone was pleased that Lloyd, a sociable and generous man, had finally found the love and companionship he'd been looking his whole life for. It was his first marriage, but Shirley's fourth. After the wedding, Lloyd brought Shirley Allen and her two daughters 15-year-old Norma and 12-year-old Paula into his home. Now he had an instant family to banish the loneliness and a true soulmate in his new wife. Norma? 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 But winter brought stress and unhappiness to the family. Go on back to your room. Norma ran away from home several times and eventually landed in juvenile detention. The marriage grew strained. Then Lloyd started feeling sick. Lloyd went from doctor to doctor. None was able to relieve his symptoms or tell him what was wrong. He tried to work around the house and yard but was too weak to complete any of his projects. Detectives learned that Shirley tried to boost his stamina with an iron supplement drink, but it didn't help. As he grew sicker, Thanks. he began keeping him away from other people. Suspicions began to center around Lloyd's new wife. Drink some more. Uh, the neighbors related to us that uh, she was segregating him uh, from neighbors. He, uh, he wouldn't be seen out very much. Uh, he wouldn't. Uh, he wouldn't be able to acknowledge uh, their hellos and their their, their gestures of greeting because uh, of of his his poor health. And it appeared to them that Shir Shirley was concealing uh, Lloyd. Then finally, she cut him off entirely. A neighbor had come to pick up a wheelbarrow he loaned to Lloyd. Concerned about his friend's diminished health, he urged Lloyd to seek another doctor. The conversation was cut short when Shirley arrived. She ushered the neighbor out and later filed a trespassing complaint against him. Shirley's behavior seemed odd, 
but investigators couldn't hang a murder case on neighborhood gossip. Birding needed to discover a motive. He did. Shirley was the beneficiary of a $25,000 life policy. And we also learned that she was uh, the beneficiary of Lloyd's will, uh, which had recently been changed. It is only natural for a wife to be named as her husband's beneficiary. But it was the timing, not the payoff, that gave detectives pause. Uh, Lloyd's health began to decline just night. days after signing the papers. That was something time, to go uh, on, but not much. It didn't mind. provide the kind of firm foundation yeah, detectives required to move forward. Birding hoped I, that an I interview with the suspect would reveal something more. But he was met only with stock home. answers. Of, of course, she gave us uh, some ex exculpatory statements that uh, Lloyd Allen's uh, death was of natural causes. He's being treated by a variety of physicians for a, for a variety of illnesses that she described to us as, as depression. Uh, there was a, a litany of uh, medications in the home uh, that she said that he was uh, taking for his treatment. The fact remained that the victim had continued wasting away with no apparent cause and no evidence of disease. Mrs. Allen was still a suspect. She had motive and opportunity. But investigators had no clues, no witnesses, and no idea what killed Lloyd Allen. Lloyd Allen was dead, and detectives suspected he was poisoned by his wife. But they had no way of proving it. The investigation stalled. This is in regard to the death of Lloyd Allen. Then My police father? got a break when a witness came forward. I don't want to talk over the phone. Is it possible? Four days after Lloyd's house? death, Shirley's daughter Norma called the sheriff's department. She told them she was in possession yes. of the poison. The Norma backed up her story with some evidence. Inside a brown paper bag, detectives found a wine bottle filled with green liquid. On the label, a handwritten warning read, don't drink. A warning that Norma told police her mother asked her to write. Norma said she wasn't sure what was in the bottle, but she suspected it was antifreeze. She told investigators that over the last two months, she'd seen her mother giving the liquid to Lloyd. Norma also told police that she'd witnessed her mother mixing gas treatment with sugar and orange food coloring to simulate the iron supplement. On the day of his death, Norma said, Shirley poured him a dose of pure antifreeze and forced him to drink it. Maybe we should call a doctor. Guided by Norma's testimony, toxicologists tested the contents of the bottle for antifreeze. A sample of the liquid was injected into the gas chromatograph. The apparatus separates a compound into smaller chemicals so it can be analyzed. Each chemical is displayed as a peak on a graph. The resulting peak was a match for antifreeze known chemically as ethylene glycol. According to toxicologist Christopher Long of St. Louis University, antifreeze with its sweet taste is a subtle, stealthy killer. The victim might never even realize he's drinking himself to death. Antifreeze would produce something um, like having a drink of alcohol. Um, but as far as a burning sensation or anything to warn you, no, it wouldn't. So it'd be the same as if maybe if you had a little uh, taste of beer or something like that, only without the flavoring. So you might get just a slight change in how you feel, but nothing really noticeable. But over time, antifreeze is deadly. As it is metabolized by the body, it produces toxins that raise the acid level of the blood. With each dose, Lloyd Allen's body and mind would slowly be destroyed. 
When your body chemistries change and your kidneys aren't working, it's not purifying your blood of the waste products. So that could, in fact, account for why he appeared uh, dizzy or a zombie-like or just plain dull. You know, his, his mind wasn't working properly. We can't seem to find because so many of Lloyd's organs were failing, it would have been difficult for any doctor to diagnose the poisoning. In the final stages, even if Lloyd knew that the woman he loved betrayed him with poison, he would have been too weak to protect himself and too confused to plead for help. Scientists determined that antifreeze poisoning was consistent with Lloyd Allen's mysterious ailment. To prove it, the body was autopsied and tissue samples were tested. His liver, kidneys, and brain contained crystals formed by the breakdown of massive quantities of ethylene glycol. It was consistent with long-term consumption of the liquid. The coroner ruled Lloyd's death a homicide by ethylene glycol poisoning. Detectives had found their poison. Now they had to be sure about the poisoner. Well, uh... Norma was a troubled teenager who'd been at odds with her mother for years. The possibility remained that she had poisoned Lloyd herself to frame her mother. After a series of interviews, that theory was quickly discounted. Norma was truly fond of the victim and had nothing to gain by his death. With the evidence in hand, police arrested Shirley Allen. They were able easily to construct their case against her. A $25,000 life insurance policy gave her the motive to kill her husband. The spiked wine bottle gave her the means. In a trial that lasted only four days, she was found guilty of killing Lloyd Allen. Shirley Allen was sentenced to life with no parole for 50 years. She died in prison. Without the forensics evidence uh, and learning that actually uh, Lloyd Allen's body contained ethyl glycol, we would not have had uh, a homicide investigation. We would not have learned of his death as being a homicide, and Shirley Allen most likely would have gotten away with his death. Because of the concern of Lloyd Allen's neighbors, a cunning murderer was brought to justice. It wasn't the only time a crime was exposed when nosy neighbors smelled trouble. It was a summer evening in 1980 when David Davis sped to his neighbor's hey, house in Hillsdale, Michigan, pleading for assistance. Davis told his neighbor that he and Shannon, his wife of 10 months, had been riding when her horse reared, sending her tumbling. She had struck her head on a large rock. Injured, but still conscious, she sent him for help. The men arrived to find Shannon Davis unresponsive. Her head was bleeding. Her skin had a bluish cast. They rushed her to the hospital. When she arrived, she had no pulse, and her pupils were fixed and dilated. Technicians attempted to resuscitate her, but failed. Doctors determined that she had died of a head injury from the fall. Case closed. But not for long. Two months later, the incident came to the attention of Michigan State Police Detective Don Brooks. Brooks had heard that Davis's neighbor had refused to let the case die. The death was ruled to be an accident, but the circumstances were such that uh, he felt this was probably a murder case. Suspicion took root in the neighbor's mind the day after the death when he revisited the scene. He noticed that the branches of a nearby tree were marred by two circular bruises, suggesting that horses had been tied there. A 
fresh pile of manure set six feet away, confirming that impression. It appeared that the Davises, the only riders in the area, had stopped here long enough to tie their horses. That didn't fit with Davis's story about the victim's horse bolting and his mad rush to find help. The neighbor, Dick Britton, was also a family friend. But he grew concerned that Davis was hiding something. First, I felt guilty thinking that way. I kept thinking, well, I got to be wrong. You know, but it, you know, it, it, this went on for quite a while and you just keep thinking and, and things just didn't add up, didn't make sense. Shannon and David had been married for only 10 months before the accident, wed after only a seven week courtship. It was love at first sight. After their marriage, Shannon came to live on Davis's farm. He taught her how to ride. To Britton and the victim's family, the account Davis had given didn't fit with the way he'd seen Shannon riding just minutes before the accident. She was a cautious rider with a quiet horse. Shannon's parents really didn't know much about their son-in-law, except that he made their daughter happier than they'd ever seen her. After the accident, the victim's parents had clashed with Davis. He wanted to have his wife cremated. Cremated? No way. Hey, listen. They insisted on burial, and so Shannon was buried. And there's a double indemnity. At the hospital, Davis told Shannon's family that he had no life insurance for her. The other will benefit by receiving. Honey, don't you think that's a little too much? But they learned that weeks before her death, the newlyweds had signed a policy. I have a contract for each of you to Now, Davis was preparing to collect on it. With double indemnity for accidental death, Davis stood to gain more than $300,000. The family believed that provided 300,000 reasons for Davis to plan a murder. To investigators, it merely looked like a grieving family trying to blame a tragic accident on the victim's new husband. The meddling neighbor was helping to stir them up. Fueled by their suspicions, Shannon's family and Britain urged authorities to reopen the case. One month after her death, the victim's body was exhumed. The examination clearly showed a fatal brain injury and bruises consistent with a fall from a horse. A routine drug screen was also conducted, but the physical damage was so compelling that the case was closed a second time, even before the drug screen was completed. Britain and the family would not let the matter rest. Hey, Mr. Britton, Don yes. Brooks in the state, please. The Detroit Free Press published an article on their suspicions surrounding their daughter's death. It prompted the state attorney's office to get involved. Don Brooks handled the case. Uh, I thought to myself, if 50% of this article is accurate, uh, there's a great deal of information to go on, and, and it's going to be very helpful, and uh, it sure leads one to believe that this is a murder case, not an accident. For Brooks, the capstone of Britain's argument involved the rock which ended the victim's life. It was the only one in the area. It might have been a freak coincidence that she happened to hit her head on it. But in light of the other evidence, this small detail raised big questions. Uh, the, the percentage of someone falling off from a horse in that area and happen to hit their head on the only rock around was so high that uh, that itself would, would should raise a lot of questions. The closer Brooks looked into the death, the more suspicious he became. He sought the results of the drug screen from the autopsy and learned that it too raised some difficult questions. It was time to seek answers. 
In the lab, a tissue sample from the autopsy was analyzed by a gas chromatograph. Every substance creates its own peak of a specific length at a specific point. These peaks are called the retention time of the substance. The chromatograph showed a strange chemical in the victim's tissue that matched nothing in the lab's database. No one knew what it was, but before they could pursue it, the case was closed again and the mystery was buried with the victim. Still convinced that Shannon was murdered, her family pinned their hopes on this mysterious peak, pressuring investigators to study it further. Technicians toiled for weeks, but couldn't identify the compound. They ruled out instrument error. They simulated the conditions of embalming and burial on sample tissues to see if the victim's tissue was contaminated after death. No matter what they did, they couldn't isolate the chemical. All they knew was that there was something in the victim's body that shouldn't have been there and they had no idea what it was. Four months after the tragic horseback riding fall that ended Shannon Davis's life, grave suspicions swirled around the so-called accident. Based on the questionable crime scene, the insurance money, and the curious lab results, Brooks was convinced that foul play was involved in the victim's death. Now he had to prove it. You put it all together and it was, it was very obvious to me that this was a, was a murder case. He set his crosshairs on the victim's husband, David Davis. But Davis had moved to Florida. Investigators had no choice but to watch him go. Though the circumstantial evidence was heaped against him, there was no solid proof that he lied about the accident. Even if I received a confession from Dave Davis, uh, we still had the problem with uh, the autopsy saying that those injuries were consistent with falling off from a horse, striking the head, and the cause of death was the injury to the, uh, to the brain. So that became the challenge of the medical community at that point. The case teetered on the mysterious chemical peak. Uncovering its relationship, if any, to the victim's death was the last chance detectives had to foil what might otherwise prove to be the perfect crime. Unable to determine what the compound was, Brooks reviewed the other facts of the crime. What he couldn't figure out was how the victim could have been unlucky enough to have struck that solitary rock. Brooks mulled various scenarios over with his colleagues, but none seemed to work. Then, a moment of inspiration struck, revealing a scheme that would tie up all the loose ends and explain the mystery chemical. If this young lady was paralyzed in some way, you know, her muscular system or her um, nervous system was paralyzed in such a way where she couldn't resist and he could create the injury he wanted, Investigators believed that the victim was immobilized before her head was intentionally struck against the rock. They began searching for a chemical that would fit a killer's criteria. A drug that could immobilize quickly, then leave little trace. It would also have to be easy to obtain without rousing suspicion. What could it be, and where would they find it? Since Davis lived on a farm, it was likely that he had access to compounds designed for animals. Detectives interviewed one of the vets employed by Davis. He described a litany of sedatives and tranquilizers. Among them was a drug that seemed a likely candidate. Succinylcholine is a powerful muscle relaxant. In humans, it can paralyze the respiratory system in seconds. Because it breaks down into chemicals naturally found in the body, SCH is considered a nearly perfect murder weapon, one that wouldn't show up in a gas chromatograph. 
At Brooks's request, toxicologist Tom Carroll of the Medical College of Ohio tested it anyway. So I immediately went over to our pharmacy, got some succinylcholine, and was able to put it onto the gas chromatograph, and it had the exact same retention time as our unknown peak. Bingo, we thought we had something. To confirm the results, the chromatograph was recalibrated and the SCH retested a total of five well, times. Each I time, the results were identical. But for absolute confirmation, the tissue samples had to be tested on the more sensitive mass spectrometer to see if the chemical could be isolated that way. The samples were sent to two labs for fine-tuned analysis. Unfortunately, neither of the mass spectrometers could distinguish the chemical in the victim's tissues. Carol took the SCH and the tissue samples to Stockholm, Sweden, where scientists were experimenting with methods to analyze chemicals very similar to SCH. Shannon's tissues were tested in the spectrometer there. The initial results were disappointing. Test after test failed to reveal the chemical. If they couldn't find it, then Davis would have committed the perfect crime. Carol wouldn't allow that to happen. Investigators pressed on. The precision that made the spectrometer so sensitive also made it temperamental. After scores of attempts, a tiny adjustment to the temperature of the equipment brought hard one success. Boom, we had found it. And I mean, you talk about a celebration. This, this was some hooping and hollering that you never believed. From there on out, it was simply a matter of doing more extractions, getting all the data necessary. We were now able to identify it in the tissues. Now, investigators had to determine how the chemical was introduced into the victim's body. More than a year after her death, the victim was re-exhumed and a new autopsy performed to look for a likely site of injection. It revealed extensive bruising on the left. These injuries told of a hard fall. The right side was uninjured, except for two curious marks, one on her shoulder, one on her wrist. These two bruises represented the faint tracks of a killer's needle. They had been overlooked before because no one suspected that a needle was used in the crime. As investigators prepared their findings, they thought their long struggle was over. Scientists in Sweden thought they'd found the weapon that killed Shannon Davis in Michigan. Through sheer diligence, they perfected a way to isolate traces of deadly SCH from human tissue. The jubilant team told investigators that they could now arrest the suspect, David Davis. We told, us, we told Don Brooks, and we told him back there, we got it, get him. Uh-uh, can't do that. The method has not been scientifically evaluated yet. The success of their test relied on an experimental method for preparing the tissue sample. Before a new forensic technique can be accepted in the courtroom, other scientists must evaluate it. The process can take years. But because of the gravity of the case, Carroll's findings were reviewed and published in a matter of weeks. Scientists had successfully proven that SCH had a role in the death of Shannon Davis. Brooks's theory had proved correct. According to the prosecution scenario, Davis set out to kill his wife on their way home from the Britons. He tied the horses, then went after Shannon with a syringe, injecting her twice with a lethal drug. For that second injection site to be delivered, she would probably have had to have been paralyzed at that point because it was precisely right on the vein 
this bruise up here was probably as a result of the struggle while he's injecting her, while she still had some life in her. And um, that's how I think, it. you know, once she goes to the, down, the ground and collapses, uh, then he can pick her up and drop her onto this rock, and that will create the effect of falling from the horse. It was a cleverly thought out plan, undone by the scientific method. Davis staged what he thought was the perfect crime. The only problem was the perfect murder weapon was no longer so perfect. David Davis was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life without parole. Brooks suspected that Shannon Davis wasn't the first person whose death by SCH poisoning was overlooked. But because of this case, hopefully, she's one of the last. And so to, to be a part of an investigation like this where the medical field basically, uh, or the information about succinodicolin in the medical field has been rewritten, uh, that's kind of a nice thing to be, to be a part of. It's impossible to know how many more victims have been killed silently by people they trusted. Poisoners may never lay a hand on their victims, but with advancing forensics techniques, it's getting harder to escape without leaving a print. As a young woman slowly grows weaker, a murder investigation gains strength. To solve it, detectives must extract a dark family secret from the grave. A tight circle of friends contracts as, one by one, its members die mysteriously. The circumstances are suspicious, but there's little evidence of murder. When a woman is poisoned to death, her survivors point fingers at each other. To find the killer, investigators must get to the source of the bad blood. Even when its symptoms are dramatic, poison is a subtle menace. The poisoner is a two-faced monster whose loved ones become victims of tainted trust. On September 19, 1979, Marie Hilly rushed to the University of Alabama Hospital in Birmingham. Her 19-year-old daughter, Carol, was very sick. For the past five months, she'd suffered severe vomiting, stomach cramps, a deteriorating nervous system, and paralysis in her legs. Her hands became clawed and nearly useless. Marie, a widow who doted on her only daughter, was frantic to find a cure for Carol's grave illness. After months of shuttling Carol from doctor to doctor, seldom leaving her bedside, Marie was at the end of her rope. Doctors told her that Carol might have a virus or some other condition, but she'd yet to get a clear diagnosis about what was crippling her daughter. Carol's illness was taking its toll on Marie as well. Marie Hilly. I'm Marie Hilly. On Carol's first day at the University of Alabama Hospital, a plainclothes police officer came looking for Marie. Yes, what can I do for you? He asked if he could speak um, to her in to private. The truth, I uh, don't really want to talk to you about right here. Be right back, Carol. Carol's mounting medical bills were wreaking havoc with Marie's finances. 
a bank and a furniture store in nearby Anniston filed complaints against her for passing bad checks. The officer served Marie with an arrest warrant. He was taking her to jail. Not wanting to alarm her daughter, Marie made up a story about why she had to leave. Carol had no knowledge of her mom's arrest. The next day, when Carol couldn't reach her mother, she called her Aunt Frida, who came to see her and tell her about Marie. Frida had news for the doctors, too, expressing her concern about Marie's care of Carol. She said that Marie moved Carol from hospital to hospital before the young woman could be properly diagnosed. She also claimed to have witnessed Marie giving Carol shots. She feared that Marie's desperate attempts to heal her daughter were only making her more ill. This possibility made Carol's doctor rethink his diagnosis. Perhaps her illness was caused by a toxin rather than a virus. He realized her symptoms were consistent with heavy metal poisoning, most commonly arsenic. Often called the great imitator, arsenic routinely escapes early diagnosis, masquerading as food poisoning or the flu. The misjudgment could be fatal, according to forensic toxicologist Chip Walls, now lab director at the University of Miami School of Medicine. In many cases, the chronic poisoning with arsenic has been missed at the uh, early stages, and the person uh, either goes on and either gets better or dies from the chronic poisoning. Hi, Miss Tilly. We're going to take a nail sample. But once it's suspected, it long-term arsenic poisoning is easy to diagnose. Carol's fingernails displayed the broad white lines, called Mies lines, that signal the presence of arsenic in the bloodstream for longer than six weeks. Following up on this crucial discovery, nail and hair samples were sent to the lab to determine the extent of her poisoning. That would help determine the source of her exposure and how long she'd been exposed. The samples are carefully weighed before they're put into what's called a digesting flask. Nitric and sulfuric acid are mixed with the sample and heated. The digested sample is then ready to be analyzed. Early readings showed high levels of the poison in Carol's samples, but it would take weeks to get more detailed results. Because arsenic is found in nature and is a common ingredient in pesticides, her exposure could have been accidental. But not everyone believed that. While the samples were being tested, Aniston police received a letter from Carol's brother. He believed that Marie Hilly may have killed her husband four years earlier and was now poisoning her daughter. Lieutenant Gary Carroll, now chief investigator, went to speak with Carol Hilly. During the interview, Carol had outlined a, a number of events that had occurred to her beginning sometime, I think, in mid-April of 1979. Carol explained that within a month, she'd endured two hospital stays. She enjoyed a brief recovery well, until August, when her illness took a turn for the worse. That your doctor gives you? She told detectives that the change occurred just after she moved from her mother's house to her own apartment. Though Carol looked forward to living alone, Marie practically moved in with her from the very first day, keeping house and doing most of the cooking. Within days, she fell seriously ill, suffering from nausea and severe cramps. Marie rushed her to a hospital where she stayed for a week. But when doctors offered no quick solution, Marie abruptly moved Carol to another hospital. 
Carol recalled that in September, while she was in the hospital, her mother gave her two orange pills and two injections. Marie told her daughter they would ease the paralysis in her legs, but still her comes. illness progressed. Marie Hilly's behavior prompted Lieutenant Carroll to request the police file on her. He knew that she had been a victim of a series of strange events ever since her husband died. Carroll hoped the files might reveal some pattern. Back in 1977, uh, our police department had uh, received numerous complaints from Marie Hilly uh, regarding vandalisms, uh, harassing phone calls, uh, burglaries, fires, uh, and etc. Uh, many uh, things going on at her residence. Marie collected substantial insurance claims for damage to her house, her daughter's car, and her husband Frank's death. Seeing a possible motive, Lieutenant Carroll looked into the status of Carroll Hilly's life insurance. Marie was the beneficiary but the policy had lapsed. Okay. I'll meet with you tomorrow. According to the insurance company, Marie had made several desperate attempts to have it reinstated, but every one of her checks bounced. Yeah. Following up on the letter sent by Carol Hilly's brother, Lieutenant Carroll received a copy of Frank Hilly's medical records. Frank and Marie Hilly appeared to be an average happy couple. They were married for 25 years and raised two children, Mike and Carol. As her kids were growing up, Marie maintained an active social life. Frank enjoyed his role of the hard-working breadwinner, active, healthy, and rarely missing a day of work. But one evening in May 1975, Frank came home in agony from an upset stomach. He stayed home most of the next week. Marie tended to him around the clock. But Frank's condition worsened rapidly. Within a matter of days, he was dead. At the time, the circumstances were considered tragic, but not criminal. And even now, it seemed inconceivable that a woman could be cold-blooded enough to poison her own family. Marie Hilly just didn't fit the mold of murderer. But in hindsight, Frank Hilly's symptoms suggested a classic case of arsenic poisoning. To be sure, investigators needed to exhume his body. It would be easier with Marie's permission. Yes. Would you write some mine? She was still in custody for writing bad checks. She denied any involvement in her husband's death. And granted permission for his exhumation and autopsy. The person at the hospital? When asked about Carol, she denied poisoning her or even giving her medication. But investigators persisted. Finally, uh, upon being confronted about having uh, given Carol uh, shots, she finally admitted that she did give, give Carol some shots. She says she got, uh, it was some medication she got from a, a nurse uh, who worked at one of the hospitals. Case in, please. But police were unable to locate a nurse matching the name or description Marie gave. One week later, Authorities exhumed Frank Hilly's body. It's said that dead men tell no tales, but only Frank could tell them that his devoted wife and the mother of his children was a murderer. While investigators in Alabama collected hair and nail samples from Frank Hilly's exhumed remains, the results from Carol Hilly's arsenic testing came back from the lab. The analysis showed abnormal levels of arsenic along the length of her hair, demonstrating long-term exposure to the poison. The hair closest to Carol's scalp 
had 35 times the amount of arsenic than on the outer part, revealing that she'd received recent high doses. Her mother, Marie Hilly, was still the prime suspect in the slow and painful poisoning of her daughter. All that remained was the proof. It wasn't long in coming. On the morning of October 8th, police received a note from Carol's Aunt Frida, along with a prescription bottle containing a clear liquid. The note said she found the bottle in Marie's jewelry box. Detective Carroll sent the bottle for analysis. A half hour later, the lab confirmed the bottle contained arsenic. A similar vial was taken from Marie's purse when she was first arrested for check bouncing. It appeared empty, but investigators suspected it might hold some residue. They rinsed it with distilled water, then tested the rinse water. Once again, they found arsenic. This is Hilly, you're under arrest for the attempted murder of your daughter. On October 9, 1979, Marie Hilly was served with warrants charging her with attempting to poison Carol. Additional warrants were served for passing more bad checks, but these charges paled in comparison to what police still suspected, that Marie Hilly had murdered her husband. Still, they had no proof. We had not received any information from the Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences on the autopsy results from Frank, so we were awaiting those. And during the meantime, she made bond and got out on the attempt to poison charge and also the uh, two check charges. But Marie could not feel too relieved. The same tests that found arsenic in her daughter's system were being used on samples taken from her late husband and with much the same result. Frank Hilly had been poisoned. The evidence showed that the poison was taken a little at a time, with a large dose at the end. On January 11, 1980, the Calhoun County Grand Jury indicted Marie Hilly for first-degree murder. Hilly received life plus 20 years for attempting to poison her daughter. But Marie Hilly wound up serving only a fraction of that time. After three years, she'd manipulated the warden into trusting her with a three-day furlough. When it was time for her to return, it was clear that Marie Hilly had escaped. But her getaway didn't last. A week later, she was discovered, apparently trying to break into a house. Her clothes were soaked and she acted delirious. She suffered a massive heart attack and died that evening. Marie Hilly was buried next to her husband, Frank, the man she poisoned to death. Why would a seemingly devoted wife and mother poison members of her family? Perhaps money was the original motive. But since her daughter Carol's life insurance policy had lapsed, there was no financial reward in killing her. Maybe, in Marie Hilly's mind, murder became its own reward. In that regard, she wasn't alone. On the afternoon of June 28, 1987, Carrie Middleton answered a call to check on 30-year-old Lisa K. Chandler in Odessa, Texas. Lisa, Lisa had been seriously depressed and her friends were concerned. Lisa. 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 Carrie found Lisa. Lisa in her bedroom, dead. She ran to phone the police, not to call in a suicide, but to report a murder. Police found no evidence of a crime, 
No forced entry or signs of struggle. In fact, there seemed no cause of death at all. I need a bag this note. Don, give me a bag. To On the nightstand lay a scrap of paper with scribbled notes, but it didn't mention suicide or anything else that could be related to Lisa's death. A washcloth on the floor had no stains or other visible clues. It seemed the victim had died peacefully and mysteriously in her sleep. Morning, Gene. How are you this morning? According to Detective Mickey Brown, now a chief of police, okay. that was reason enough to investigate okay, further. Good. Thank you. Uh, you have a victim here that uh, apparently there's no reason for cause of death and this is a young female there's no trauma so you I immediately become suspicious as to what caused this young lady's death out of her mind with grief Carrie Middleton insisted to police that her friend was murdered but without any evidence their best strategy was to wait for the autopsy report Tissue samples were sent to the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine, where forensic toxicologist Gary Wimbish tested them. We look for the drugs or substances with the highest probability of having an association with the cause of death. For example, ethyl alcohol, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, other volatile substances or alcohols that may have been involved. Uh, drugs of abuse would be high priority and then second with uh, routine prescription medication. Blood specimens revealed a high concentration of ethyl alcohol found in wine or beer. Though it may have contributed, the alcohol couldn't have caused Lisa's death on its own. With the victim's death still a mystery, Detective Brown couldn't discount the possibility of foul play. He'd learned from Carrie Middleton that Lisa was in the middle of a bitter divorce from her husband, Kyle. Carrie also said Lisa was having an affair with David Dowler, a mutual friend with an exotic lifestyle. Well, the more she talked, uh, she got into uh, telling us about Dowler, uh, and it began to read like a uh, Tom Clancy novel. You know, he was uh, claiming to work for the government, to be a, work for the CIA, to be a, a spy catcher, things of that nature. And, and uh, she was very sincere in what she was telling us, but it, was, uh, it seemed far out at the time. Because Dowler was the last person to be seen with the victim, an interview was arranged. He was cooperative and seemed friendly and personable. Dowler claimed Carey was mistaken about his work for the CIA. But he did share the opinion that Lisa Chandler was a victim of foul play. He also had an idea of who her killer was, Kyle Chandler, Lisa's husband. He said Kyle was furious that she was cheating on him. Good morning. Kyle Chandler was next on the list to be interviewed. Fearing he was the prime suspect in his wife's death, Chandler brought his lawyer with him. Kyle also felt that Lisa was murdered, but he pointed the finger back at his accuser, David Dowler. Kyle Chandler portrayed Dowler as an unusual man with a sinister edge. He owned and operated a one-hour photo shop but claimed that was only a cover for his real job as a CIA agent. As a government insider, Dowler claimed he knew in advance which friends were in danger. He seemed to be right. According to Kyle Chandler, Dowler knew more than he was letting on about the death of Lisa Chandler and the unexplained deaths of two of their other friends. The investigation into Lisa Chandler's death was taking an unexpected turn. When Detective Mickey Brown looked back over the files, he discovered that Lisa Chandler was the third of her circle of friends to die mysteriously. And in each case, David Dowler was mentioned as one of the last people to see the victim alive. 
Four years before the death of Lisa Chandler, another of Dowler's girlfriends met a similar fate. Lisa Craig was found lying as if she'd died in her sleep. There were no signs of forced entry into her home, nor any signs of trauma on her body. The only suspicious things were notes scribbled in the margins of her Bible. Craig believed someone wanted to kill her. Craig had a history of anorexia nervosa. An autopsy found no other evidence, so the medical examiner concluded she died as a result of that condition. However, since there was no specific cause of death, he left her file open and saved her tissue samples. Hi, ma'am. How are you today? Hi. Three years later, the next to die was Dowler's business partner, Juan Casillas. After Dowler was laid off from his job at an oil company, he and Casillas opened a photo store together. In 1986, Kyle Chandler found Casillas at his home, dead on the kitchen floor. The autopsy revealed an unidentified substance in his tissues. Samples were saved according to hospital policy, but no cause of death was determined. Detective Brown now wondered if Kyle Chandler did more than just discover Juan Casillas' death. He began to think that maybe he caused it. Brown learned that Juan Casillas was married to Lisa Chandler before Kyle married her. First, Casillas died, and now Lisa was dead too. That gave Kyle Chandler a direct connection to two of the three mysterious deaths in his tight circle of friends. But Kyle Chandler wasn't the only suspect. In each of the three deaths, David Dowler made the phone call that led to the body being discovered. Detective Brown had three deaths and two likely suspects. He needed help sorting them out. He remembered an offer made to him by Carrie Middleton concerning David Dowler. She was convinced Dowler was the killer, living out some deranged fantasy. She wanted the chance to prove it. During the interview with Carrie, I expressed some reservations to her about the story that she was telling me, and she voluntarily said uh, that she would be more than happy to wear a, a microphone or a wire where I could firsthand listen to David Dowler telling her these stories. David Dowler may have pretended to be a government agent, but Carrie Middleton was about to do some real undercover work. Not everybody. True to her word, she agreed to wear a wire so that police could hear her conversations with David Dowler. Detective Mickey Brown also had surveillance cameras set up in Carrie's apartment so police could watch them. Brown knew that time spent here would either help the investigation or take him down the entirely wrong road. We had a total of 16 hours of recordings on him on about three occasions. He totally dominated the conversations. He talked constantly. Most of the talk was idle banter. But in one of these conversations, he described how to murder someone by putting chloroform in their car ventilation. Then he outlined a likely method the killer would have used to kill Lisa Chandler with chloroform. Dowler offered detailed descriptions of how Lisa Craig and Juan Casillas were probably murdered using cyanide. And he told Carrie he was afraid she might be next. These were either the veiled confessions of a mad serial killer, the ramblings of a man desperate for attention, or both.
His own words made Dowler the prime suspect. But the proof of those words had to be verified in the lab. Tissue samples from Lisa Craig and Juan Casillas were sent to Gary Wimbish to test for cyanide. The test that we uh, employed to assay for the cyanide uh, actually is, is a testing protocol that is uh, not ancient, but certainly has been around for a while, called a Conway diffusion cell. It's a simple device that holds a blood sample in one compartment, a trapping solution in the center, and sulfuric acid on the other side. The container is then sealed and rotated so that the blood and acid mix. The acid releases the cyanide from the blood in its gaseous form, which is then trapped by the solution in the center compartment. The solution changes color to indicate how much cyanide is present. We found rather large amounts of cyanide present in the blood specimens of Casillas and Craig. Uh, the concentrations were about uh, seven to ten times the amount uh, that are often found in lethal cases. The results were indisputable. Both Craig and Casillas were killed with cyanide. To test Lisa Chandler, Wimbish used a gas chromatograph to detect traces of chloroform. A microscopic tissue sample was placed into the apparatus, which was calibrated to show the unique spectroscopic fingerprint of chlorine compounds. This is the internal standard, and this is where the test revealed that Lisa Chandler had enough chloroform in her system to kill seven people. Unmasked by his own incessant conversation, the real David Dowler was finally revealed. And then once we verified through the post-mortem and the toxicology results that this was in fact how the victims had died, we knew then that we had our predator. We knew who we had then. David Dowler wasn't a concerned friend or a government agent, but a very sick and dangerous serial killer. Armed with the toxicology reports and information gathered from surveillance, Detective Brown secured a warrant for Dowler's residence. But he wasn't through yet. He wanted to be sure he had enough to win this case. He hoped for a confession, if not to police, then to Kerry Middleton. We decided to tape one more conversation to try to obtain as much evidence as possible. By going through with another meeting, Brown was using his key witness as live bait for a known killer. Kerry was putting her life on the line. By now, Dowler might have suspected she was talking to police. Even with officers just outside, she'd be on her own if Dowler moved in quickly with a knife or gun. As an extra precaution, Detective Brown wired Kerry's entire home and had additional police standing by just in case. That evening, when Dowler came to Carrie's home, the two spoke amiably at first, concentrating on small talk. Then, Dowler began talking about how the police were bungling the investigation into Lisa Chandler's death. He mentioned that he kept a pistol in his car and once again told Carrie that she was in danger. Then, he suddenly announced he had to leave for a moment, but that he'd be right back. That was enough for Detective Brown. He's heading south. Not wanting First to risk street. Carrie's life any further, he had his officers move in and arrest no, Dowler no, in his car. Get get down. Get your hands up. On your knees. On your knees. From the evidence retrieved at the scene, Detective Brown may have acted just in time. We arrested Dowler shortly after he left the witness's residence, and we found in his possession a pistol, a silencer, ammunition. Uh, we also found some lockpick sets and a uh, and, uh, ski mask that he had. 
these suspicious articles couldn't begin to suggest the vast and deadly arsenal Dowler had at his disposal. At his house, detectives uncovered explosives, blasting caps, crude eavesdropping equipment, more homemade gun silencers, and chemicals used to make explosives and poison. The police needed a truck to haul it all away. Dowler's lab was the incubator for three murders. Mixing chemicals into a lethal brew, he was able to concoct his deadly schemes. He denied killing Lisa Chandler and told investigators he was only trying to help her. How she'd be honest about it, which really bothered me. First, he said he had her write down questions about their relationship. Then he said he would help her find a hypnotic state by pouring chloroform into a washcloth that was covering her face. According to Dowler, she would then be able to answer her own questions with her subconscious. He said that she was getting tired, so he left. Yeah. Dowler claimed she must have taken more chloroform herself to commit suicide. Investigators didn't believe it. No bottle of chloroform was found at the scene. The forensics report also proved Dowler's story couldn't be true. That couldn't have happened because when we, when Dr. Wimbish did the toxicology, she had seven times the toxic amount in her system and uh, she would have been sound asleep long before she could have administered, self-administered that much chloroform to her. Dowler had administered the fatal dose. He may have lived a fantasy life as a secret agent, but he played the real life role of murderer. In January, 1988, David Dowler was sentenced to life in prison for the death of Lisa Chandler. Because he received the highest possible penalty, he was not tried for the other two murders he is suspected of. David Dowler killed for the sake of killing. In Little Rock, Arkansas, investigators found that poison was just one part of a killer's elaborate master plan. Georgia Weaver had recently come to live with her sister, Jeannie Allen. When Jeannie had told her younger sister that her cozy home had become too much for her to manage by herself, Georgia was happy to move in and help out. On December 19th, 1992, Jeannie was struck with a sudden, intense illness. Georgia, who also felt ill, rushed her sister to the hospital. For two weeks, doctors puzzled over the root of her symptoms, thinking it might be food poisoning. When her condition worsened, they ordered tests for heavy metal poisoning. The results showed Jeannie had nearly 20 times the normal amount of arsenic in her system. Intentionally or by accident, Jeannie Allen was being poisoned. Jeannie's son, Jerry Allen, reacted to the news by going to the police. He was certain his mother's poisoning was no accident. He told them that the situation wasn't always so rosy between his mother and his aunt, Georgia Weaver. Detective Steve Moore listened to Jerry Allen's story. He told us that they had been involved in a dispute in years past over a uh, inheritance from their mother who had died and apparently Miss Weaver had spent some of the money uh, without Miss Allen's knowledge. The sisters hadn't spoken to each other for four years. Jeannie had only recently decided to make amends and invite Georgia back into her life. Jeannie was lonely. 
Her husband, James Allen, was incapacitated with a stroke, and her kids were grown. Georgia began spending the night at Jeannie's house and cooking all of the meals. But Jerry believed that Georgia was scheming to take financial advantage of his mother once again. Three months before Jeannie fell ill, Jerry confronted Georgia at his mother's house, triggering a tremendous argument. Georgia called the police to have Jerry removed from the premises. Bad blood clearly flowed within the family, but there was little to link it with Jeannie's current condition. When Jerry Allen first came to us, we were concerned about, were we getting in the middle of a family squabble? Was there really a, a crime here? Was there really something we needed to be involved in? But two days after Jerry filed his report, Jeannie Allen died from arsenic poisoning. Now the police had to get involved. Though it was still uncertain if Jeannie's poisoning was intentional, the death needed to be investigated. Police began by interviewing Jeannie's friends and family members. Thank you. Certainly. Need to eat? No, no, thank you. One of the first was Georgia Weaver. All right, what can I help you with? Cordial and friendly, her anger rose when she talked about her nephew, Jerry Allen. Georgia told police that Jerry resented her because Jeannie trusted her more. She claimed that if anyone poisoned Jeannie, it would be Jerry, who was jockeying to gain control of Jeannie Allen's money. Investigators now had two suspects, and yet they weren't even certain a crime had been committed. Before they could determine that, they had to determine how long Jeannie Allen had been exposed to the arsenic and how she had consumed it. To find out if Jeannie Allen had been intentionally poisoned, investigators examined her hair. The arsenic leaves a record along the growing strands. The hair samples are cut into segments, then wrapped securely in a paper form that establishes the chain of evidence. Because plastic bags could contaminate biological samples, labs use paper wrapping. Each segment is individually tested for arsenic. The duration of a person's exposure can be determined by seeing how much of the hair contains the poison. According to criminalist Gary Lawrence, it is not uncommon to find arsenic in any hair sample. Most people have a normal background level of arsenic within the body. And if they receive from some form uh, an amount of arsenic that's abnormal to the body, I think the system has a way of working some of that out. If the arsenic were in the environment, investigators would expect to find minute traces along the length of the hair. If the poison were administered intentionally, it would usually appear as one big dose on the portion of hair closest to the scalp. I don't believe it's very easy to hide arsenic poisoning. Uh, it can be done, but again, even when you get up to the, the long-term dosages, even at low levels, the buildup of the arsenic within the body is eventually going to show up. The report showed normal trace levels of arsenic along most of the length of the hair. But on the segment closest to the scalp, the hair contained 13 times the normal amount of the poison. The results suggested that Jeannie Allen's death was no accident. Now let's get everything out of this closet. To find the source of the arsenic, police conducted a search of her house and confiscated all of the food and medicine they could find. About 100 items in all. At the Arkansas State Crime Lab, each sample was bombarded with x-rays in a technique called x-ray fluorescence. Electrons in the samples become excited, giving off specific levels of energy. The lab looked for energy levels characteristic of arsenic. The lab tests for the samples taken from Jeannie Allen's home would take several months to complete. Hi, what's the problem? 
In the meantime, police conducted interviews with her neighbors. It wasn't long before they narrowed their list of suspects from two to one. Many neighbors said that mysterious changes occurred once Georgia Weaver moved in. Jeannie Allen came outside less and less. Georgia collected the mail and ran errands. Jeannie soon stopped calling her friends. And when they tried to get in touch with her, Georgia was always there, blocking the way. If somebody went over there or called over there, Georgia answered the phone. Georgia came to the door, and they never saw Jeannie again. It was like she didn't exist, basically. Uh, Georgia checked the mail. Georgia basically took over the household, which made me suspicious that a, a grown lady that was not in any medical you know, condition at that time, no senility or anything, would just let somebody take over their home like that. As suspicions began focusing on Georgia Weaver, investigators uncovered more to incriminate her. On December 22nd, just days after Jeannie Allen was admitted to the hospital, Georgia went to the bank and, using a power of attorney, closed Jeannie Allen's account. She took $1,300 and the contents of her safe deposit box. Georgia was arrested at her job in a local motel. In her possession was about $1,000, Jeannie Allen's car, a credit card, and her power of attorney. Upon closer inspection, investigators noticed an odd detail about the power of attorney. Yeah, so if you know these guys in there. On this document, legally handing Jeannie's rights to Georgia Weaver, both Jeannie Allen's printed name and signature were misspelled. In order to get a true sample of Georgia's signature, police had her sign her name and Jeannie's several times in front of witnesses. Oh, no, we're not finished yet. The signatures were sent to the Arkansas State Crime Lab for analysis. Jeannie Allen's known signature was compared with Georgia's version of the signature. The differences went beyond the spelling errors, according to Dawn Reed, chief of question documents. There were pressure habits that were extremely different. Extreme differences were noted between the spacing habits of the writer on the question document and the known handwriting of Jeannie Allen. The uppercase J was a two-stroke J that Jeannie Allen usually wrote, and on the question document it was very flourished. But when Reed compared the signatures written by Georgia Weaver to the one on the power of attorney, she knew she caught the forger hands down. I positively identified Georgia Weaver as writing Jeannie Allen's signature on the power of attorney, which is totally conclusive. There was no qualified opinion. She wrote that. The, qual the probability that any other individual could have is nil. Georgia was arrested for theft and forgery. She may have been a killer, too, if investigators could only prove it. Georgia Weaver posted bond for her arrests on theft and forgery. But her troubles weren't over. A few weeks later, she was charged with stealing employee checks from the motel where she worked and forging the signatures on them. She was arrested again. Though she was proving to be a thief and a forger, investigators had nothing to tie her to the murder of her sister, Jeannie Allen. Then, a co-worker reported finding a bottle of rat poison hidden where Georgia always kept her purse. It wasn't a brand the motel used. It was sent to the police and passed on to the Arkansas State Crime Lab for analysis. The active ingredient was arsenic. This evidence, tangible but circumstantial, was the first to link Georgia to the poison. Now, investigators needed to link the source of the poison to her sister. In August 1993, the extensive tests on items from Jeannie Allen's home were complete. 
Arsenic was discovered in two containers of punch and a bottle of cold medicine. The link was established. Detective Moore only hoped it was strong enough. At that point, I felt we had what we needed to bring her to justice. I, we knew that it would be a, a battle as far as getting her convicted, but we didn't feel that we could, we had any other choice but to try to get her put in prison where we felt she belonged. From the evidence, investigators surmised that after ingratiating herself with her sister, Georgia began spiking her medicine and beverages with the rat poison she kept hidden at her workplace, finally killing her with one big dose. On May 4, 1994, Georgia Weaver was convicted of the capital murder of her sister, Jeannie Allen. I believe what motivated Georgia was greed, power, and also probably a motivational fact was that she wanted what Jeannie had as far as a home, a family, the financial stability that she had, whereas Georgia was alone, uh, out of money. And I believe that, that maybe that she saw that's the only way she could get what that had was to take this route. But the route she took proved to be a dead end. Georgia Weaver was sentenced to life in prison with no parole and is currently serving at the Arkansas Department of Corrections. The act of poisoning begins with a simple premise. The poisoner believes he can hide his guilt behind a mask of concern. But time and again, forensics has proven this premise false. A young electrician suffers an agonizing death the victim's hair may determine whether it was a job-related poisoning or a deliberate act of murder. The wife and mother-in-law of a police officer die from apparent heart attacks just weeks apart. A paper trail leads to a possible double homicide and a bizarre double life. An engineer with no apparent health problems becomes mysteriously ill and dies. A bounce check triggers a relentless search for the truth. Poison is a silent killer, but not completely undetectable. By utilizing advances in forensic technology, detectives can now expose the perpetrator of an invisible death. September 7, 1991, paramedics were called to the home of Robert and Joanne Curley in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Joanne told emergency technicians that her husband, Robert, was in unbearable pain. Though they could not immediately identify the source of the problem, they found his vital signs were dangerously low. The 32-year-old electrician was rushed to the hospital. Doctors there were already familiar with Robert Curley. They had treated him for a rare nerve disease just a few days earlier. At that time, Curley complained of pain in his hands and feet, as well as hair loss and severe nausea. Now, the escalation of Curley's symptoms caused them to reconsider their diagnosis. The hospital's neurologist quickly ordered new tests, this time for exposure to toxic chemicals. Two weeks later, doctors confirmed that Robert Curley was suffering from exposure to thallium, a toxic heavy metal. Thallium, a naturally occurring element, was widely used in pesticides until the early 1970s, but was banned from widespread use after researchers determined that exposure to concentrated amounts could be deadly. 
Its use is now restricted to industrial purposes. Forensic toxicologist thing. Dr. Frederick Readers explains the effects of thallium poisoning. It's a nerve poison, and it starts out very often with burning feet, and then you start getting ascending paralysis. You know, you can't walk, and then eventually you can't use your arms. Then your eyes start to droop, and your neck starts to go, and then your brain and your heart and everything goes. So it's a very insidious poison. For Robert Curley, the information came too late. The damage had already been done, and the effects were irreversible. After suffering a massive heart attack, he was placed on life support. Soon after, he was declared brain dead. Robert's wife, Joanne, gave permission for her husband's life support to be turned off. A few hours later, Robert Curley was pronounced dead. The official cause of death was cardiopulmonary failure due to thallium poisoning. Now they had to determine how and where he came in contact with the deadly chemical. A representative of OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, was sent to investigate. Joanne Curley stated that prior to his death, Robert had been working on a major renovation on the campus of a local university. That sounds good. Soon after he began the job, Curley complained to co-workers of flu-like symptoms. By the end of the first week, he could barely walk. He said his feet right, felt Bob? like lead. His yeah, colleagues is. noticed that he looked sweaty and red-faced. Robert Curley would spend the next month in and out of hospitals, going from one medical crisis to another. The facility where Robert Curley worked housed chemistry labs, as well as rooms where chemicals were stored, including five containers of thallium salts. OSHA investigators began a painstaking examination of the chemistry lab. They needed to identify the source and remove it before others were injured. The team took numerous air samples and exhaustively tested various objects and rooms to determine if there was another source of exposure. They came up empty. There were no signs of tampering or leakage from any of the containers. They learned that Curley was storing cabinets in his garage that he had taken from the university chemistry labs. They searched his home, but found no traces of thallium on the cabinets. With no answers to explain her husband's death, Joanne Curley contacted a toxicologist at the hospital. She seemed terrified that she and her daughter might also have been exposed. She demanded that they be tested for thallium. Joanne Curley tested positive, but the amount of thallium in her system was not at a toxic level. She would not require treatment. Her daughter had even smaller amounts in her system, about 10 times less than her mother. Robert Curley had over 900 times the lethal dose of thallium. Doctors insisted that the high levels of the toxic chemical could not have come through skin absorption. He must have ingested a fatal dose. The hospital passed the test results on to the police. After ruling out suicide, police concluded that the poisoning was no accident. Robert Curley had been murdered but who would want him dead? Investigators needed to know every aspect of Robert's daily routine. As police collected items from the house, Joanne told detectives that her husband would routinely take a half gallon thermos filled with iced tea to work with him each day. Chuck, if you don't mind, can you uh, 
Any tea left over at the end of the day was shared by the family that night at dinner. The half-gallon container was collected for future analysis. Two other thermoses were also collected, one quart-sized and the other a pint size. Joanne told investigators that neither of these two containers had ever been taken to work by her husband. All of the items collected were sent off to the lab and tested. While waiting for the results, police continued their investigation. They spoke with Robert's fellow employees. There were over 150 tradesmen on the renovation team at the university. Since they all worked at the place where Robert got sick, they were all considered suspects. Police had to determine if any of them had a motive to kill Robert Curley. But no one seemed to dislike the electrician. Robert's co-workers revealed that Joanne had recently come into a large sum of money. She had been awarded over a million dollars in a wrongful death suit after her first husband died in a traffic accident. The financial windfall was a source of friction. Robert wanted to use the money to start his own electrical contracting company. Plus you wanted the yard to be Joanne there. made it clear no, she had no intention not. of bankrolling her husband's dreams. It's my money. Well, we can talk no, about this. we can't. It's my money, and you're not getting it. Investigators learned that as a result of Robert's death, Joanne stood to collect an additional $300,000 as the sole beneficiary of several insurance policies. The information was enough for police to put Joanne on the suspect list. But since she and her daughter had also been poisoned, it seemed unlikely that she was the killer. In the lab, examiners tested nearly 100 items taken from the Curley's home. Only two of the items from the Curley home tested positive for thallium. The half-gallon thermos Robert took to work with him each day, and one of the smaller thermoses Joanne insisted never left home. For police, the findings were troublesome. Since thallium was found in a thermos Robert never took to work, there was no direct link between the poisoning and the university. Police began to suspect they had been looking in the wrong place for Robert's killer. The lab results were leaked and published by a local newspaper that was following the investigation. Why don't you just stop Joanne told police that she remembered something that would explain why the smaller thermos tested positive. She said that shortly after her husband was hospitalized, he called her and asked that she bring in pizza and iced tea for a farewell party for his roommate. Joanne said she transferred the remaining tea from the half-gallon thermos to the smaller container and took it with her to the hospital. As long as the half-gallon thermos remained the focal point of the investigation, Robert's co-workers could not be dismissed as suspects. And none of them had a reason to kill the electrician. The investigation hit another dead end, one that would last for the next three years. Three years after the poisoning death of Robert Curley, the Pennsylvania State Police took over the investigation. With no leads or suspects, investigators faced a challenge. Sergeant Dave Wondolowski was assigned to the case. The very first step, I, you know, I made the determination that we were going to start right back from scratch, right at the very beginning, and treat this as if the crime had occurred yesterday. Okay. Investigators began with the forensic findings. The original autopsy had not determined when and how often the murder victim had ingested thallium. Investigators feared the answers they needed had gone to the grave with Robert Curley. On August 23, 1994, 
Robert Curley's body was exhumed for examination. Hair and nail samples were taken from the body. Dr. Frederick Readers wanted to establish a timeline using Robert Curley's hair. What you can find out with the hair is when the poison was administered. The hair grows at the rate of about a third of an inch every month so that you can take a small piece of a hair that's right at the root and you see what's happened just a few days ago. You take it at the tip, in this case it was a 19 centimeter tip, it's basically what happened just about a year earlier. The hair samples were tested using a furnace atomic absorption instrument. In this test, a sample is placed in a graphite tube and heated to the point of vaporization. A light is shined through the tube. The amount of light absorbed by the vapor determines if thallium is present and how much. Robert Curley's hair samples told an especially revealing story. The hair is long enough so that we can say that in November of 1990, he started getting thallium and probably even earlier. And that apparently then there was, a, a, you know, he, he got another dose around March of 1991. Another one, a smaller one perhaps, uh, sometime in April. And then he got a whopping dose in June. And then he continued to get doses because instead of going up and down, it just kept going up. Then there was a pause and then we found actually that towards the very end that it was going up like crazy. Robert Curley had started ingesting thallium well before he began working at the university. He had been slowly and methodically poisoned to death. Then, a final massive dose had been administered around the time he was last hospitalized. The one person with both motive and access was Joanne Curley. Investigators scoured Joanne's previous statements. Of particular interest was her account of bringing pizza and tea in a pint-sized thermos to Robert and his hospital roommate in the days before Robert's death. Investigators questioned the roommate, Richard Bonin. He gave them a very different story than the one Joanne had given a few years earlier. According to Bonin, neither he nor Robert had asked Joanne to bring them food or drink. Nor were they celebrating Bonin's departure, which did not take place for another two days. That night, according to his roommate, Curley's condition worsened dramatically. He was screaming in pain. Bowman summoned help. He distinctly recalled that Joanne served the iced tea in a large half-gallon thermos. Police believed Joanne had administered the last fatal dose to her husband as doctors tried in vain to save his life. On December 12, 1996, Joanne Curley was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. As part of a plea bargain agreement, Joanne confessed. Only months after she and Robert wed, she realized that the marriage had been a mistake. Divorce was a possibility, but the thought of Robert's life insurance policy tantalized her. An old jar of rat poison she discovered in the basement seemed to be the answer. She could rid herself of her husband and net nearly $300,000 in the bargain. Joanne laced Robert Curley's iced tea each day. To divert suspicion, she administered a harmless dose to her daughter and herself. 
for a time, her cover-up and frequent diversionary tactics worked. Joanne Curley eluded police for over five years. According to Pennsylvania State Trooper Robert McBride, the forensic findings were invaluable. The forensics gave us a timeline and time periods when people or the murderer would have had to have access to him. And by that means, we were able to exclude other potential suspects. This wasn't really an investigation. Normally, an investigation starts and you zero in on a suspect. This was totally opposite. This was an investigation of exclusion. We went about eliminating people until we got down to one. Joanne Curley was sentenced to serve 10 to 20 years in the Pennsylvania State Penitentiary. Curley poisoned her victims slowly over time. While other killers aren't as methodical, the technique proves just as deadly. In this case, the names of the victims and killer have been changed. On January 30th, 1985, patrolman Walter Wallace raced to Memorial General Hospital. As a veteran of the Roselle, New Jersey Police Department, he had often responded to medical emergencies. But this call was personal. The doctor informed Wallace that his wife, Beth, had collapsed and suffered a seizure. Wallace was stunned. His wife was fine when he left for work that evening. Beth had no history of seizures, and though she struggled with a weight problem, she had been in relatively good health. As Beth's vital signs rapidly failed, doctors could offer the patrolman little hope. Nor could they find an explanation for her symptoms. Three hours later, Beth Wallace was dead. Beth and Walter had been married for 24 years and had three children together. Beth's mother, Rose Parker, was living with them when the tragedy occurred. Because of the sudden and mysterious nature of Beth Wallace's death, the doctor requested an autopsy. Cause of death was determined to be cardiac arrest. A month later, tragedy struck the Wallace home again. Rose Parker suffered a massive heart attack. Paramedics worked frantically to stabilize her and swiftly transport her to the hospital. But it was too late. Shortly after her arrival, Rose Parker died. At the Union County Prosecutor's Office, investigators learned of the deaths from Rose Parker's lawyer. The fact that two healthy women had died suddenly and within a month of each other seemed suspicious. He asked investigators to look into Walter Wallace. Assistant Prosecutor Richard Rodbart followed up on this information. Anytime you have a public official, much less a police officer, who is suspected as uh, being the perpetrator of a crime, uh, you have to be uh, extremely sure that the evidence points in that direction before you proceed and before you bring a case against that individual. To rule out foul play, investigators contacted Dr. Reng Lang Lin, chief toxicologist for the state of New Jersey. An examination of the file showed that no toxicology testing had been done. Rose Parker's body, they quickly learned, would yield no clues. There had been no autopsy. She'd been embalmed and buried. But at Beth Wallace's autopsy, tissue samples had been taken. These were sent off for extensive toxicological testing. It would be six weeks before investigators would receive the results. 
Captain Edward Johnson requested Walter Wallace's personnel file from the Roselle Police Department. From its contents, a portrait of the man emerged. Wallace was an exemplary police officer. He was popular with his superiors and peers. Nothing in the file was out of the ordinary or raised suspicions. Captain Johnson read the file in its entirety, including Wallace's military discharge papers. It showed him to have won several important medals and uh, listed a lot of combat service over in Vietnam. For whatever reason, uh, I can't remember exactly what, what sparked it, but I was looking at it, and I was at first impressed by the record that this fellow had. Then there was something on a 214 that just didn't look right. Johnson contacted the U.S. Army to verify the record. His suspicions were confirmed. He never had any of those medals. He was never in special forces. In fact, uh, we can only we can't verify overseas service on the part of this man. So the 214 that was in the police department file was a forgery. Walter Wallace was a liar, but was he capable of murder? To find out, investigators would need to talk with the people who knew him best, his fellow officers. There is a certain difficulty, obviously, in investigating a police officer for, for a crime because you have to go into his department, talk to people that he works with every day, and the more people you talk to, the more you're signaling where your investigation is going. Hi, Jeff. You got that file Investigators for me? made a low-profile visit to the Roselle Police Department while Wallace Thanks. was off duty. I'll get it back to you in a couple of days, okay? They didn't expect Wallace's yeah. colleagues to be forthcoming, but one officer sure. surprised them. According to the officer, there was something perplexing about Walter's marital status. He suspected that Walter had married a woman named Jacqueline Deal while he was still married to Beth. Investigators wondered, was Walter legally divorced or living a double life? Through Beth's friends, investigators learned Walter was away from home a lot. He told Beth he was being treated at a VA hospital for exposure to Agent Orange. And that's why sometimes for a week or so he might be gone, or he might be gone for the whole weekend, and she's not going to see or hear from him, and she's not going to be able to get in touch with him because the ward that he's in over at the hospital doesn't have any kind of telephone. He was pretty good, and for a while he was pretty good at juggling all of this. Investigators traveled to nearby Elizabeth, New Jersey, to question Wallace's other wife. Thank you. Well, Jacqueline Deal confirmed that she and Walter had been married on November 2nd, 1984, three months prior to Beth Wallace's death. She said Walter had divorced his wife the summer before. Walter had brought over the divorce papers when it was final, and the two had celebrated. Investigators found the divorce decree among documents provided by Rose Parker's lawyer. Numerous irregularities made them question its validity. Investigators searched for the original divorce decree at the county courthouse. There was no record under the name of Wallace. They then searched under the case number only to discover it belonged to somebody else's divorce. The case name clearly read Martin versus Martin, not Wallace versus Wallace. Police surmised that Wallace used his badge to obtain the Martin's divorce decree. Wallace altered the document in order to obtain a marriage license with Jacqueline. Investigators sent the document to the FBI lab for further analysis. They had caught Walter in another lie. And this one indicated a possible motive for murder. But investigators were perplexed. Why would Wallace fake a divorce and kill his wife rather than legally end the marriage? Looking for a potential financial motive, investigators scrutinized Beth's will. 
Walter stood to inherit everything, including the family house. But something about this document also caught the investigator's eye. The will was dated just two months prior to Beth's death. The timing seemed too convenient. Further investigation revealed the existence of an earlier will. In this version, Beth had left everything to her mother. She left only one dollar to her husband. Investigators wondered if he had forged the second will and then killed his wife. The new will was notarized by a secretary in the Roselle Police Department. But she denied ever witnessing the will or affixing her seal to the document. The secretary noted that Wallace often worked at her unlocked desk. He could have easily used her notary seal to certify a document without her knowledge. Investigators had built a strong circumstantial case against Walter Wallace. But they needed proof that his paper trail led to murder. Investigators in Roselle, New Jersey, suspected Officer Walter Wallace was responsible for the death of his wife, Beth. Now they hoped to support their circumstantial case with hard proof that Wallace poisoned her. Four months into the case, the New Jersey State Lab reviewed the results of a general toxicological screening of Beth's blood, tissue, and urine. Because the screen only tested for the use of illegal drugs and alcohol, it came up negative. Laboratory technicians went further, subjecting the samples to a battery of tests to rule out prescription drugs, heavy metals, and a number of ingestible toxins. Still, they found nothing to explain why Beth died. But they had yet to test for one particularly insidious killer, cyanide. Samples from the victim were prepared in test tubes. A color reagent was then added. If cyanide is present, a reaction occurs. Ultimately, the sample turned a dark shade of purple. Beth Wallace had cyanide in her system when she died. To determine the concentration of the poison, the sample was read by a spectrophotometer. A lethal dose of cyanide is about 2.5 milligrams per liter. Results showed that Beth Wallace had nearly twice that much in her blood and more than three times that amount in her spleen. The detective's next move was to tie Walter Wallace to the cyanide. Every detective that we had in the major crimes unit went out there and started banging on doors in the factory district that they have over in Roselle. We went to every, every one of them. It's like, well, do you think they have cyanide or not? Stop and ask. Do you have cyanide? Are you missing any? Did anybody ever come looking for any? Any of it on your hands, make sure you wash your hands because... The canvassing paid off. A clerk at a metal plating factory revealed that Wallace purchased a quantity of potassium cyanide. The officer told him he needed the chemical to raise the serial number on a handgun. On June 18, 1985, Walter Wallace arrived at police headquarters and was asked to report to the chief's office. There, he was placed under arrest and escorted to jail. A warrant was issued to search the Wallace residence. The prosecutor's office enlisted the aid of their narcotics team. Due to the nature of their work, team members are skilled at conducting meticulous searches. James Durkin was a member of that team. Once we got to the house, um, it was somewhat evident why the chief had asked us. 
The house was um, a littered mess from attic to basement. Um, and that particular day, we had a team up in the attic as well as the basement, and we were going to meet in the middle. Police removed some 100 items from the Wallace home. Hey, Captain, is that something? A manual typewriter was found hidden behind the couch. Legal documents, including the original Martin divorce decree, were found in a drawer. Upstairs, the narcotics squad found a trap door leading to the attic. Writing samples, along with a page of forged signatures, were collected. Within 15 minutes, a team member discovered a crucial piece of physical evidence. Bingo. An empty bottle. What have you got? The handwritten label read, potassium cyanide. The items were examined in the laboratory, along with the divorce decree and will. A confiscated typewriter was found to have a spacing error consistent with the altered documents. More damaging, signatures on several of the papers were determined to be forged by tracing. Finally, cyanide was found in the bottle recovered from Wallace's attic. The label was in his handwriting. In May 1986, Walter Wallace was found guilty of bigamy and the first degree murder of his wife. Police theorized that Walter Wallace's double life was becoming too complicated. Instead of filing for divorce, Walter chose murder. But his attempt to finance a new life at his wife's expense was his undoing. Wallace was sentenced to serve from 30 years to life in prison. He was never charged or tried for the murder of his mother-in-law, Rose Parker, due to lack of evidence. The secret life of Walter Wallace was motive for murder. For other killers, the motive is far less complicated. In this case, the names of the victim and killer have been changed. On July 17, 1991, Dana Jacobs awoke to find her husband, Larry, violently ill. This is a little different. It seemed like food poisoning. He had intense stomach pain with vomiting and diarrhea. What's your stomach feel like? When his condition hadn't improved by morning, she decided to take him to the emergency room. She stopped at the neighbors to drop off their children. John Ballier was concerned. Larry had been in and out of the hospital for weeks with gastrointestinal problems. Jacobs was admitted at Humana Suburban Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. Doctors administered intravenous fluids to keep him from dehydrating. There was cause for concern. Although he displayed the classic symptoms of food poisoning, he did not respond to treatment. Hello. The next day, Dana called John Ballier with tragic news. Her husband, Larry, was dead. She asked him not to say anything to the children until she could tell them in person. I think it had an impact on us, just having the kids there, having a good time, oblivious to the fact that their father had died and that their lives were going to change probably dramatically. An autopsy was performed with Dana's permission. Doctors wanted to know what had killed the otherwise healthy 41-year-old man. Apparently, Jacobs had suffered a massive heart attack. 
yet there was no indication of heart disease or what triggered the attack. His sudden death was considered a mystery. On Monday morning, John Ballier related the sad events of the weekend to his colleagues at the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. Of course, the, the kids play together. Hey, John, how are you? Shortly afterward, Ballier received intriguing news from a fellow attorney. Oh, man, it's terrible. His brother-in-law owned a chemical company. Dana Jacobs had been a recent customer. Hey, how are you? Fine, how are you doing today? In fact, she came in the day her husband got sick. She purchased a chemical called colchicine. His brother-in-law only remembered the purchase because Dana's check had bounced. And his brother-in-law had called him, complaining about the fact that this check had bounced. Um, and he thought it was kind of an interesting coincidence that the, the two events involved the same family. Ballier researched the chemical. He found that colchicine in small doses is used to treat gout. Larger amounts could be fatal. He contacted Barbara Weekly Jones, assistant chief medical examiner for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. There is a fine line between therapeutic levels, meaning giving um, relief from gouty arthritis, and uh, levels of the drug that can cause significant side effects. And the main side effects of this drug are nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, which um, when it reaches a bad, uh, severe state can uh, cause death of an individual. Dr. Weekly Jones was aware that the general drug screen performed at autopsy would not reveal a specific toxin such as colchicine. She prepared blood and tissue samples for further testing. She was not optimistic the test results would prove definitive. If Jacobs had ingested colchicine, it had probably been eliminated from his bloodstream prior to his death. Their only hope was to find traces of the chemical in specific organs. Because the gastrointestinal tract absorbs it, uh, it gets partially metabolized in the liver and it gets excreted in the kidney. So those three organs would be the most likely areas to find any residual cochising at the time of the autopsy. It would take two weeks to obtain the test results. Investigators would have to wait for the answer to a crucial question. Had Larry Jacobs been murdered? Larry Jacobs, a 41-year-old father of two, had died of a mysterious stomach ailment. John Ballier, Jacobs' neighbor and a Commonwealth attorney, was suspicious. He assigned Detective Pat Conkling of the Jefferson County Police Department to investigate. Ballier told Conkling that the dead man's wife had purchased a potentially lethal chemical called colchicine just days before his death. The detective's first order of business was a visit to the state medical examiner's office. The results of Larry Jacobs' toxicology test had finally come in. He had 160 nanograms per milliliter of colchicine in his system. More than enough to kill him. Go ahead and take a seat. It was time to confront Dana Jacobs. Jacobs, I just have a few questions I'd like to ask you. First, I have to inform you that... But investigators were surprised by the reception they received. She invited us in. There was uh, no hint of any problems. She was very cordial with us. Uh, we never had the uh, first bit of hesitation on her part of talking with us. She readily admitted to buying the colchicine. She said she needed the substance to kill algae growing in her swimming pool. Investigators asked if she still had any left. She said she had used it all in the pool. I asked her how she uh, came across the chemical, 
and uh, she gave us the name of several businesses that uh, suggested that uh, she use this chemical to control the algae. Detectives contacted these businesses in an effort to confirm Dana's story. No one remembered telling her that colchicine could be used to control algae. In fact, most had never even heard of the substance. Investigators were at an impasse. They knew how Larry Jacobs died, but not why. Perhaps an examination of the couple's marriage would yield more clues. Investigators visited Larry's sister. She told police that the couple was in financial trouble as a result of Dana's compulsive spending. Family members had lent them thousands of dollars, none of which had ever been repaid. Larry told his sister that he had taken steps to keep Dana's spending under control, but to no avail. Their credit cards were at or over their limit. One of Larry's co-workers recalled having to lend him money on a business trip to pay for meals and a hotel room. The embarrassed engineer explained that he had neither cash nor available credit at the time. And there was insurance money. Larry had two life insurance policies on himself. One for $138,000 and the other totaling $250,000. Detectives dug deeper into Dana Jacobs' background. They learned that the respectable wife and mother had a troubled past. Before she was married, Dana had served time for bad check charges. From her prison records, investigators learned that a counselor had diagnosed her as a pathological liar who urgently needed psychiatric treatment. Dana Jacobs was arrested and indicted on murder charges in January of 1992. Police were certain they had cornered a killer. But a new clue was about to emerge, a clue that could possibly put her in the clear. Five months after Larry Jacobs' death, his widow Dana was indicted for murder. Out on bail, Dana was back at home with her children. Just weeks before her trial, she made a discovery that could exonerate her. A suicide note from her husband. In it, he said the financial strain was too much to bear. Investigators were skeptical but the note did appear to be in Larry Jacobs' handwriting. Moreover, it was well known that the deceased had been depressed about money matters. With his background in chemical engineering, it was possible he was familiar with colchicine and used it to end his life. The suicide note was forwarded to Stephen Slater, the Commonwealth's document expert. The first thing he noticed was that different pens had been used. You'd have a paragraph or a sentence or two that's a fairly thin line, uh, small point writing instrument, and then it would shift to uh, a medium or a broad instrument for another word or two or three, and back again. It quickly became apparent that the note had been created by cutting and pasting words and phrases from Larry Jacobs' writings. After it was pasted up, uh, the close examination of the note showed that it had first been copied by passing it through a fax machine to produce a copy. In the five and a half months following her husband's death, 
Dana Jacobs spent close to $200,000, half of the insurance money she'd collected. One of her first purchases had been a fax machine. The suicide note she doctored represented a last desperate gamble to throw authorities off her trail. Another piece of damning evidence was provided by John Ballier's daughter. I know how she did it. Oh, that's not something you no, should say. No, Dad, I really do. I know how she did it. Sarah Ballier testified that she saw Dana Jacobs filling oh, clear so. gel caps with white powder. Sure. Mrs. Jacobs told the girl what that she was making Mrs. vitamins Jackson? to put into her husband's food. She explained it was the only way she could get him to take his vitamins. Police theorized that Dana Jacobs used a familiar household routine to poison her unsuspecting husband. On November 23, 1992, Dana Jacobs was convicted of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Lethal, but invisible. Poison has historically enabled killers to strike without fear of reprisal. But unseen no longer means undetected. Thanks to advances in forensic science, detectives have new tools to catch the killer and unravel the mystery behind an invisible death.